Good evening and welcome to the August Astro Talk. Uh, this is the second last Astro Talk before we finally return to Mueller Hall after the Lightscape event finishes. Uh, the next Astro Talk will be in a, a few weeks' time with Lisa Harvey Smith. Uh, but tonight, however, we have to hear from Rami Mando and his talk on pulsars. But before we begin, I'd like to say, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. The ACV loves bringing you these streams. Uh, but we couldn't do it without your support. So remember, if you're enjoying tonight's stream on Facebook, you can donate stars, and on YouTube, you can donate stickers. Uh, all donations, no matter how large or small, help us bring these streams to you. Um, I'd also like to let you guys know about some upcoming events that we have. We have, uh, on the August August the 19th, we have Wine Under the Stars up at Shiraz Republic Winery. On September 22nd, we have a public viewing night at Caulfield Racecourse. Uh, the people who had tickets for the last event we had that was cancelled due to weather who rolled those tickets over don't need to book tickets. You can just use those same tickets. Um, we also have our Sea Lake Astro Fest coming up in November, which Rami will be part of as well. Um, that's over the Melbourne Cup weekend. And for members, we have the Galactic Centre Star Party coming up on the 16th of no uh, September at the Leomau Dark Sky site. Uh, tickets for all the events are available on our website. Uh, with the formalities out of the way, let's introduce you to Rami Mando. Rami is currently a first-year PhD student with Macquarie University CSIRO, working with Parks Pulsing Pulsar Timing Array Project. He and the team study some of nature's most exotic objects, rapidly rotating neutron stars that emit beams of radio waves from their magnetic poles, known as pulsars, using Australia's loved iconic radio telescope. Murray Yang, the Parks Radio Telescope. In this talk, Rami will talk us through what pulsars are, how they form, and what scientists use them for, including touching on recent news of the detection of gravitational wave background. He'll also walk us through his current research on his favourite pulsar. My favourite pulsar is the Nissan pulsar, uh, which did something very unexpected in 2021. Rami's um, shaking his head at that really bad joke. And on that note, welcome to the stream, Rami. Right. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Um, just to check, um, you can see my screens and you can hear me properly. Is that okay? We can indeed. So the floor is yours, Rami. I'll, I'll pop out and hide and you take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you to the ASV for this opportunity to also share some of the science that has me really excited as well. Um, I'm not sure if you folks can see me in an inset or not, but I will be uh, there towards the end if you can't see me at the moment. So I apologise if you haven't uh, got a little picture of me on your screen there. Um, to begin with, I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people as the traditional custodians of the lands from which I'm coming to you all from today. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders both past and present uh, of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people that we also have with us today as well. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm, as Mark has said, I'm a first year PhD student with Macquarie University and with CSIRO's Space and Astronomy. Um, I spend my time studying my favourite kind of astrophysical objects, and they're called pulsars, as we just heard. Um, and you've all probably heard of that big radio telescope out in parks, right? Uh, it's called the DISH, and it's owned and operated by uh, Australia's National Science Agency, CSIRO, and I'm very, very lucky to be one of the people that uses this uh, instrument as part of my research. And I do that, as Mark did earlier on, um, as part of my uh, work with the Parks Pulsar Timing Array project. Now, a few years ago, I also started a space community website called spaceaustralia.com that I'll sort of mention a little bit down the track as well. Um, along with that, I know we've got a few astrophotographers uh, with us tonight as well. So um, one of the things I've actually enjoyed doing over the last few years is astrophotography. Um, and I'm, I shoot sort of nearby and distant objects with my 8-inch schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And I do that from my rooftop and my backyard. And here's a few samples of those photos that I've taken. Um, in particular, I actually genuinely love it, actually capturing galaxies as I find them extremely challenging. And these are, these are a broad set of those galaxies that I've captured um, in the past. Um, and the reason why I find them challenging is because I'm only one kilometre away. I'm in Balmain in Sydney. I'm a one kilometre away from Sydney's CBD and it's massive light pollution. So being able to see 
galaxies or capture galaxies at this level of detail from the middle of a city is pretty rewarding, uh, in my opinion, anyway. But let's uh, let's switch away from the optical frequencies and let's uh, switch over to the radio frequencies, which is what tonight's talk is all about. So here's what's on the on the menu for tonight. Um, so first of all, we'll talk about what pulsars are and how they form and how they emit. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, how they evolve over time and some of the applications that we use it for. Uh, and then delve into touching on a little bit about pulsar timing techniques. And lastly, taking a very quick look at some of the research that I'm conducting as well. Uh, in particular, for this pulsar that I have called the, uh, the problem child pulsar. And you'll see why a little bit later on as well. Um, so just some housekeeping rules. I always like to mention this when I'm actually uh, doing a call from home. Well, I am from home today. We're calling from home today, sorry. I do have a little dog and he's a great little dog, but he's a bit of a rascal at times. And so he can get a little bit shouty. Uh, so if that happens, I do apologize in advance. Um, there's also going to be some really nice visuals and animations coming up. So um, I encourage you all to go to full screen mode uh, if you can to get the full effect. Um, and just a heads up about some of those animations. There is a little bit of flashing um, in some of the animations. Uh, for example, the next slide has a little bit of flashing, but I'll try to give you a heads up before that sl the flashing slides come in. So if you're susceptible to uh, issues with flashing on screens, then uh, just be aware that some of these animations do have that as well. Okay, so pulsars, what are they? What do they do? Why are they the best objects in the universe according to my very, very unbiased opinion? Uh, well, I guess our story for, of, of the pulsar story actually starts and begins at the end of a star's life. So let's jump back to that first to, uh, to start our story about pulsars as well. So stars are basically giant energy production machines, and they convert potential and kinetic and gravitational energy into radiation via thermonuclear processes. Um, now, so most of the lives, stars are considered to be what's called on the main sequence. And that just means that they're burning hydrogen in their core and it's living through the normal parts of their lives, I guess. Uh, now, the fusion of that core hydrogen produces you know, energy and an outward radiation pressure that sort of pushes outwards and it's balanced by the inward gravitational pressure as well of all the mass trying to push into the center. And that forms something called like hydrostatic equilibrium and it forms those beautiful spherical shapes that we see stars in. Now, the reason why that equilibrium is sustained is because, you know, for the main sequence part of a star's life, during its, 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 its the major part of its life, it's got that core fusion happening. So there's a regular amount of energy being pushed outwards to balance the inward push. But like, I guess, like, like, like us, stars age and they get a bit more older and grumpier and a bit more slower. And, and so uh, the balance of outward pressure uh, and inward gravitational starts to fall out of place. And... What, are, what, what, that, what, what the outcome of, those, of that sort of aging process is and the dying of, of a star is all dependent on how much mass the star had to begin with. So in this lovely diagram that you can see on your screen, uh, down the bottom we see some of the smaller stars, which are kind of orange and yellowy colour, and they evolve over the long term. And, you know, when they end their lives, they just go kind of quietly into the night. But if we look at stars a little bit higher up in that diagram, so the more massive stars that start off more massive when they grow up, well, I guess when they go out, they go out with a bit of a song and a dance. Um, and there's generally a few pathways uh, that stars follow when they die. And so each of these pathways produces a different kind of uh, object known as a remnant, which can be very exotic as well. Now, stars like our sun, for example, they're average and mid-range. And when their time comes, they'll sort of just expand and puff off their outer layers, leaving behind a beautiful planetary nebula like we could see in this image here. Now, in the center of that nebula, I hope you can see my mouse moving, but in the center of that nebula is a, a star called a white dwarf. Now, white dwarfs are literally the hot cinder cores left behind after all that material has puffed away and the planetary nebula is left. So they're no longer producing energy through fusion processes in their core, but they're still very, very hot. I mean, after all, they are like the, you know, the former cores and now exposed cores of former massive stars. And these objects are made up of much heavier elements that were actually fused during when the star was uh, you know, living in its main sequence phase. And so we observe a lot of helium white dwarfs, and that's because helium is the first uh, product of hydrogen fusion. But there's also a whole bunch of other white dwarfs, such as a carbon oxygen white dwarf, for example. And they're very common. And there's some even more massive ones that are called oxygen neon magnesium white dwarfs, but they're a bit more rarer. 
Now, in white dwarfs, the inward pressure of gravity is balanced by the outward pressure of the electrons being squeezed into their most tightest configuration that they can possess. So effectively, the electrons can get pushed together and they can't be pushed together any further, so they exert, exert a force back, and that's basically called electron degeneracy pressure. And that allows for that hydrostatic equilibrium to form on this remnant object. And that stabilizes the white dwarf to about, you know, something about the size of Earth with about the same radius as Earth, which isn't very big when you think about it because it's relative to other stars out there. Um, but even electron degeneracy pressure has its limits. And it turns out that you can squeeze about 1.44 times the mass of the sun uh, into an object about the size of Earth before other things and other interesting things start to happen, as we're about to see in the next slide. And just a heads up, the next slide will have a tiny bit of flashing as well. So remember how different mass stars have different outcomes when they age and die? Well, some stars are much bigger than the sun when they're born, and they die uh, in a much bigger way as well. And it turns out that the mass range of the progenitor star is between 8 to 25 solar masses. Something remarkable actually happens. So instead of just puffing away their outer layers, like that white dwarf situation we just saw earlier along, um, the star undergoes one of the most violent and one of the most destructive events known in the universe, and that's called a supernova. And during this event, the majority of a star is blown outwards into space and you know, any planets that were orbiting this star at the time are also lost during this process as well. So supernovas can be very bright. They can inshine, outshine their entire galaxy uh, at times. And here's an example of that. So in February 2021, I took a photo of galaxy NGC 1566 from my backyard. Um, and that's that top panel there. And then I took another photo of the same galaxy in December that year, so about 10 or so months later. And you can see in this photo uh, where the arrow is indicated in the bottom panel, so the December photo, uh, the, uh, that, that supernova event occurred. And look how bright it is. That's a single star. System that, well, actually, it was two stars that merged and actually created a supernova event. Uh, and it illuminated so much light that it actually outshines the entire galaxy. Like the, the, the galaxy's got hundreds of millions of stars in it, and that one star shines brighter than all of them individually. Now, that's not the only thing that happens when a supernova occurs. Uh, they also leave, these, these events leave behind uh, a remnant object, and this is known as a neutron star, which is, I guess, extreme to say the least. Uh, they're made up of lots of material, and they're all jammed into a star about the size of a, of a city. And here's a render of, of a, a scale size of a neutron star that's at 1.4 solar masses hovering over the city of Sydney, just to show you some scale reference there as well. Now, their mass range is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, but they can also get as high as uh, about two, or just over two times the mass of the sun as well. So can you imagine, like, squeezing all this material into something smaller than the city of Sydney. And that's why neutron stars are extremely dense. In fact, they're so dense that if you took a teaspoon of neutron star material, it would weigh as much as all of humanity combined. So in other words, if we took all of humanity, all a billion of us, and we crushed us all down into something the size of a sugar cube, that would be about the density of a neutron star material, which makes them the densest objects in the universe that we can measure. So why don't these things collapse on, the on themselves, I guess? Uh, well, neutron stars also have degeneracy pressure, but instead of using uh, electrons, uh, neutron stars are made of neutrons and they're squeezed tightly together. And so they, the neutrons press outwards and produce neutron degeneracy pressure as well. And that halts any further contraction due to gravity as well. Now, just like a white dwarf, there's also an upper limit on how much you can actually pack into a neutron star as well. And it turns out that about three solar masses, so three times the mass of the sun, um, even neutron degeneracy pressure ca uh, cannot win out against gravity. And that, that's, there's a few, theoretical limit, and that's actually known as the tolman oppenheimer volkov limit. And that's the very same Oppenheimer that's in the movies at the moment, at the cinemas, uh, the so-called father of the atom bomb. So what their work found out was that when you have a star that's a progenitor star that's 25 solar masses and above, um, the neutron degeneracy pressure cannot withstand the inward crushing force of gravity uh, during that supernova event. And so the collapse doesn't halt and produce a neutron star, uh, keeps going on and on and pr produces something else. And that something else is a black hole. And that occurs when the collapse is so powerful that it crushes all the material down into an infinitely dense point. A uh, singularity that's got such a strong gravitational field 
uh, but out to a certain radius that not even light can escape, which is why we call them a black hole. Now, these objects are com completely, there's a lot of mystery about these objects. We know a bit about them, and there's many other things that we don't know about them. Uh, some of the laws of physics even break down around them or are right near the uh, centers. Uh, but that's a whole other story so, uh, that we, we won't go into today because black holes have uh, their own talk, I guess. Um, so we've heard about white dwarfs, we've heard about neutron stars, and we've heard about black holes as compact remnant objects post-supernova. But where do the pulsars fit into all of this? Well, pulsars are neutron stars. They're just a variety of neutron stars and have very similar properties. So, for example, they have hot surface temperatures, some of them emit in radio, some of them emit in gamma rays, some of them emit across the whole wide uh, range of electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, they've all got powerful magnetic fields. Uh, all of them are rotating. Some are in binary systems and a few, a very few, even have planets around them as well. Now, pulses were actually discovered by uh, then PhD student, Dane Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell in 1967. Um, and when they were first noticed, Jocelyn and, and, and the team thought that it could have been aliens uh, for, a, you know, for a couple of minutes there. Uh, but when then a second and a third uh, pulsar was found, they realised that this was something more natural. Um, now, unfortunately and controversially, uh, her supervisor went on to claim the Nobel Prize for this discovery. But today we do recognise and pay respect to Professor Bill Burnell as a true person who discovered pulsars. So... What, what makes a neutron star a pulsar, I guess, is a good question to ask. Uh, well, it turns out you kind of need two ingredients for that to happen. Uh, the first is that the neutron star needs to actually be spinning very rapidly on its axis, which is not very hard to achieve. And that's because the progenitor star, uh, when it collapses uh, during a supernova event, its radius decreases. And to conserve angular momentum, its angular velocity must also increase. Now, we see these effects here on Earth as well. Uh, when we see an ice skater spinning with their arms extended, uh, their radius, in a way, is kind of large. They've got, the, you know, from arm to arm, they've got a wide sort of uh, radius. But then when they pull their arms inwards, uh, what happens is their radius decreases, but they spin faster on their axis. And that's actually uh, that, that conservation of angular momentum. Uh, so some pulsars are actually spinning extremely fast. And in fact, the fastest spinning object in the universe that we know about is a pulsar. It's a millisecond pulsar, and it's called uh, PSR J1748 minus 2446 AD. And it rotates on its axis about 716 times per second. So when you do some simple math, that works out to be about 24% speed of light. So again, mind boggling when you think about moving 1.4 solar masses at 24% the speed of light. The actual forces involved must be incredible. Now, the second ingredient that you need to make a pulsar is, along with its uh, rapid rotation, is a really powerful magnetic field. And I'm talking on the order of a billion or even a trillion times that of your fridge magnets at home. Uh, and so where do these extreme magnetic fields come from? Well, again, just like the angular momentum, the magnetic flux of the former star is conserved during the supernova collapse event and so the once very large magnetic field that was sort of spread across the larger star uh, is now sort of compressed downwards and imprinted on a tiny compact remnant, uh, making it extremely powerful. And so when you have these two things, a pulsar is born. You know, rotation needs to be fast enough to trigger pulse emissions. The magnetic fields need to be strong enough to generate those pulse emissions. And so radio emissions emerge from those magnetic poles of this rapidly rotating compact object. And when those beams sweep past the Earth, uh, much like a lighthouse beam does, we can measure that with radio telescopes. And that's why we call them pulsars, because we see a pulse every time their beam sort of passes our view. But even though they beam uh, their radio waves directly at us, their signals are very, very faint, and they've got to compete with a whole lot of noise out there. So, for example, there's terrestrial noise, such as radio frequency interference, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and mobile phones and television signals. Uh, and there's also signals from space, like satellites, for example, beaming down on Earth, and even astrophysical objects like the sun. And to counter these interference, uh, we need to build our telescopes far away from uh, human populations, and we also employ uh, mitigation and zapping sort of strategies to sort of clean our data as well. Now, since pulsars are broadcasting in radio waves, and radio waves are much longer wavelengths than the optical ones that our eyes detect, uh, and since they're also very faint, we need to build very big telescopes uh, to collect this data, like this absolute beauty, beauty on, on your screens right now. 
So this image is of uh, CSIRO, uh, sorry, this image is from CSIRO, uh, and it's of the CSIRO Parkes Radio Telescope, which has a Wiradjuri name as uh, Muriang. And that means that translates to sky world, which I think is just a beautiful, beautiful name. Um, it happens to also be my favourite telescope in the world, and it's been reshaping our understanding of the cosmos for about uh, just over 60 years now as well. And yes, before anyone asks, we have most certainly played cricket in the dish. But if you look very carefully, we're pretending to. There's no actually ball that we use because effectively we didn't want to break the dish while we're pretending to play cricket. Um, so where do we find our pulsars? Well, for the most part, we find them within our own galaxies and, and mostly within the galactic plane. So again, I hope you can see my mouse, but it's, uh, it's in this sort of central region over here that we find them in. And so far, we found about 3,300 of them. And this is a plot that I used in my thesis last year for my master's, and it sort of shows the distribution of pulsars of, uh, across galactic coordinates. And on the x-axis, we have the galactic longitude, and on the y-axis, we have the latitude. Um, and from this projection, what we're seeing is the galaxy sort of edge on from our neck of the woods inside the galaxy. So we sort of live in the outer suburbs of the galaxy, and we're looking inwards towards the center of the galaxy, which is why you have that sort of disc-like structure in the center. Uh, those X, X crosses there are the, you know, the normal classical pulsars, and then we've got different kinds of pulses on here as well, and some of their remnant uh, products as well. Now, some pulsars do exist below the galactic plane and above the galactic plane, and that's because uh, when they actually, when a supernova event occurs, uh, it sometimes can give the pulsar a little bit of a kick, and that sort of moves them over time away from the galactic plane, which is why they end up a little bit higher and lower and away from the galactic plane as well. And generally, uh, we only see pulsars in our galaxies, except we have found a few in our neighboring satellite galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds. And that's what these red drops are here. So that's a large, the pulsars in the large Magellanic Cloud. And there's a few more pulsars in the small Magellanic Cloud as well. But beyond the Magellanic Clouds, we don't really see pulsars uh, in other galaxies uh, beyond uh, our local sort of region of space. And that's because we think that it's likely because the distances are way too big for the pulses to be recognized against the background noise. And there's also a variety of pulsars. They don't just come in one flavor. So for example, uh, we have the young classical pulsars, which are born in recent supernova events. And by recent, I mean like about 1,000 to 50,000 years old, um, much like the crab pulsar, which is the, the video I'm showing at the moment. Um, and we know that this pulsar was precisely born in the year 1054. And the reason why we know that is because in that year, Chinese astronomers were the great astronomers now keeping lots of documentation and they, they saw a bright flash in the sky uh, of a star, it's exploding. They didn't know what it was at the time, but they recorded it and documented it. And today, when we look in that region, we actually see the Crab Nebula, which is a remnant of the supernova, sorry, the remnant of that supernova event. Uh, when we point out radio telescopes in that region as well. We also notice that there's a pulsar in there and it spins about 33 times per second. Um, now the crab pulsar doesn't only emit in radio, it actually emits across a wide band of uh, different frequencies, um, including optical and infrared and a whole range of them. And so when it does, it actually does illuminate that surrounding region, which is what these videos are showing as well. Now this video on the right here is slowed down by a value that I can't remember, apologies. But if you look very carefully, the lower of the two stars is that uh, is that crab pulsar, but it is actually rotating at 33 times per second. So your eye probably uh, will find it a little bit harder to detect as well. And the crab pulsar is actually considered a very young pulsar because it's only a, a thousand or so years old. Now, there are these beasts out there called magnetars, and they're quite young as well. But what makes them different from other pulsars is that they have incredible magnetic fields. In fact, the most powerful magnetic fields uh, that we know of in the universe, which is roughly about 100 trillion times that of your fridge magnet in some cases. And it's so powerful that if we actually took a magnetar and we place it between the Earth and the moon, then all sorts of weird things start happening. So, for example, uh, it would wipe out our credit cards, which is a nice way to get out of our credit card debts and, you know, get back at the banks. But there's also other things that might actually harm us along the way, like its massive gravity and its radiation as well. Um, but if we can neglect the gravity and the radiation, if we put one about a thousand kilometers away from Earth's surface, then some really horrible things start happening. And that is that 
the magnetic field of the magnetar is so powerful that it would actually disassociate the electrons from the atoms in your body and matter would begin to sort of you know do become weird and sort of fall apart i guess um it's and everything around us from humans and from pets to rocks to buildings it would all start to sort of you know be affected very strongly by these powerful magnetic fields from a thousand kilometers away and it'd be like that time when you know when Thanos snapped his fingers i guess and you know half the universe just went up you know in, in, in a puff another type of pulsar and the one that i study are called millisecond pulsars um, and they spin hundreds of times per second but they weren't always actually born that way they too were once classical pulsars and uh Something happened along the way, which we're going to hear about a little bit uh, very shortly as well. Um, and they do; they, these ones have weak magnetic fields or weaker magnetic fields. It's still very strong from our perspective. Um, and over the long term, they can actually be extremely stable. In fact, they actually rival some atomic clocks here on Earth as well. And one last flavor of pulsar that I want to show, there are more, but one last flavor that I want to show was, uh, I think, the nastiest pulsars of them all. These are the spider pulsars, and they're millisecond pulsars that have these companions that have strayed too close. And so uh, the radiation that comes off the pulsar slowly evaporates the companion. So in other words, the pulsar eats its companion, much like the spiders do here on Earth, the arachnids on Earth. Um, and so these pulsars are come in two different types of categories. We have the black widows uh, and their Australian cousins, the redbacks. Um, and each of these categories is dependent on the mass and the orbital period of that companion as well. And so, you know, by observing the different types of pulsars and neutron stars, we can start to get a picture about their populations and their evolutions as well. And you might be thinking, what do you mean evolution? These things already, you know, this is a form of massive star that's already dead, but there shouldn't be any more evolution, right? Um, but there is actually, and that's because pulsars are always emitting energy out into space. Um, and that doesn't just include their radiation, like their beams of, uh, of uh, radio waves or their high energy emissions that we measure from Earth. Pulsars also dump a lot of their energy as magnetic dipole radiation into their surrounding regions. And according to the conservation of energy, if that's happening, then the pulsar will slow down its rot rotation over time. Now, this slowdown is what's known as a period derivative, um, and it's, an it's a very observable and very measurable parameter that we actually have a lot of detail about as well. And here's an example of what that sort of uh, slowdown looks like for the crab pulsar. So on the x-axis, we have the time, and you can see the year up here. It's starting from about 1970 to about 1990. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the uh, spin frequency, and you can see it over time linearly slowing down. Um, and so that gives us a tool to work with when we want to sort of plot the populations of pulsars. And when we actually look at their period of the pulsar, so their spin periods versus their slowdown rates, their period derivative, and we plot all the pulses that we know about, uh, we get something called a P, P dot diagram, which is this diagram that we're looking at here. This is something that I've taken from my thesis as well from last year as well. Um, and what this kind of shows, it shows the evolution of pulsars over time. You can sort of follow their track a little bit um, as they move across this sort of plot. And they sort of, new pulsars that are formed sort of start about here. And we know that because we can see that uh, the symbol for supernova remnants is this little star-like symbol, and we can see some of the pulsars are actually associated with supernova remnants. So they're sort of starting up here. They've also got like um, uh, slower, uh, sorry, uh, they've got different uh, period derivative, and, they've got, and they're spinning much slower as well. Now, over time, they release their energy out into space, be it magne magnetic dipole radiation or the electromagnetic emissions. And they sort of follow a pathway that sort of takes them down and into this sort of section over here, which is where the majority of the pulsar population lives. Um, I should point out as well that we do have the magnetars, those very powerful ones, and they all live up here um, in this corner up here. And that's where the most powerful magnetic fields are as well. But going back to our pulsars, uh, you know, the majority of the pulsar population lives here and it's sort of, you know, live out their life for about 10 to about 100 million years, giving off their energy and eventually they get to the point where they actually have slowed down enough where they can no longer be producing emissions. Remember, we do need to have that fast rotation and that strong magnetic field to create those beamed radio emissions. So they land in this sort of shaded area called the, uh, uh, appropriately called the Death Valley. Um, and that doesn't mean that the pulsar is dead. The pulsar is definitely still alive and well and truly there. It just means that the emissions of radio emissions have actually stopped being detected and therefore we can no longer see it. But it's just a firmly cooling neutron star at that point. Um, and so 
you know, that's that's kind of where we fit where some of those pulsars' lives as radio emitters end, but they still go on cooling as thermally new, uh, cooling neutron stars. But something interesting also happens in this plot, and you might have noticed that there's a subpopulation that lives down in this corner over here in the bottom left. Um, and here is, you know, they've got very fast spin periods, they've got very low magnetic fields, and they've got uh, low uh, pure derivatives as well. And so those sort of uh, those sort of features give us some, some some clues as to what's happening here. And I'm about to show you what happens next uh, in the slide. But just note that next slide will have quite a bit of flashing. So if you're susceptible to that flashing, I would probably definitely turn away from the next slide. Um, so in this animation, um, which is a very short animation, we have a pulsar that's in the binary system, which is a regular kind of star, and that's kind of interesting in itself, right? Because remember, the pulsar to form had to go undergo a supernova event. And, you know, that this binary survived that supernova event is quite interesting. But eventually the pulsar slows down enough and the uh, companion star reaches a point in its life where it expands and uh, sort of spills over its material into the pulsar's gravitational field. And the pulsar sort of steals up that material and accretes it and spins itself up um, as part of that process. Of course, it's transferring angular momentum to it. And so what happens is the pulsar that was once quite, once spinning around and went quiet is now spun up to rotational energies that are fast enough to restart the engine that creates those pulsar radio beams. And so when you have a millisecond pulsar, which is spinning very fast, and a companion, which is a white dwarf uh, in, in a binary system. So what can we use our pulsars for? Um, well, it turns out there's a wide range of experiments that we can do uh, from the comfort and safety of our own home without getting too close to one of these nasty things. Um, so, for example, we can time our pulsars and try to work out how dense their material is, especially when they're inside binary systems. Um, so this material that's inside the pulsar is under enormous pressure and under enormous gravity, and we still really don't know what's, what, what goes on inside uh, these pulsars. Um, so I guess learning about how matter behaves under these conditions can teach us a whole new level of science. In other cases, we also find exoplanets around pulsars, and it's very, very rare. I think there's only about nine or ten that have been found so far. Um, because remember, during that supernova event, uh, when the star blew up, most of the actual planets would have been lost or destroyed. But we have found a few, and in fact, the very first exoplanets, the very first planets that were found outside our solar system, were found around the pulsar in 1992. Um, yeah. The other thing we could do is that because pulsars squeeze so much material into a very small space, it makes them really extreme environments. And when they're in these binary systems, that makes them very valuable for us because we could then use them to test Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is our leading theory of gravity. Um, we'll, ne we'll never be able to create these kind of conditions on Earth. So having these remote access laboratories is kind of very, very uh, useful for us to test uh, these extreme uh, situations where gravity is actually interacting between these two systems. Um, and in the 1970s, mid-1970s, I should say, scientists did just that. They observed a pulsar and a neutron star in orbit around each other. Now, as part of this system, whether it's a pulsar or a neutron star and it was orbiting in a certain time frame, general relativity, so Einstein theories, predicts that these kind of systems should radiate gravitational waves. And as a result of those grav gravitational waves being radiated, uh, the general relativity it tells us that the distance between these two objects should shrink. And so scientists measured this value over time um, and found that it matched literally almost exactly the value predicted by Einstein's theory decades earlier. And here in this plot, you can see the, uh, the solid line that's sort of coming arcing downwards over time. Uh, that's the actual prediction from uh, general relativity. And the data points, these individual data points here, are what uh, what the observations were. And you can see how close they were literally on top of that prediction line, which is remarkable because Einstein wrote his paper decades and decades earlier, even before people knew that neutron stars and pulsars existed. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, millisecond pulsars are, and pulsars in general are located all across the galaxy, which means that we can turn the galaxy into a very large scale detector. And we do that to actually look for very low frequency gravitational waves. And you might have heard about this about a month ago as well, where our team and several other teams around the world uh, we are now the strongest evidence yet of detecting these types of gravitational waves, which is all extremely exciting. Now, gravitational waves were, um, were sort of predicted by Einstein, um, you know, 
about 100, just over 100 years ago. Uh, in the mid-1970s, as I just mentioned, there was some indirect evidence of gravitational waves found through that pulsar neutron star system. But in 2015, uh, our first very direct evidence of gravitational waves were found by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations uh, around the world. But the gravitational waves they found in that year and since then uh, were related to stellar mass gravitational waves. So when a star or a very big star explodes and creates a black hole or a neutron star. But the gravitational waves that we're talking about here, when you use pulsars from around the galaxy, are related to uh, masses that are of billions of times the mass of the sun. So the, the supermassive black holes that reside in the centre of galaxies, and when they sort of orbit and in spiral around each other, um, they effectively release these, uh, oh, sorry, radiate these uh, nanohertz regime gravitational waves, which we can use pulsars to detect. Um, and it's telling us about the story of how galaxies merge and collide over the history of the universe. Um, I won't go too much into detail about this because it's a whole other talk in itself, but um, if, a very quick shameless plug here. Um, if you're interested in finding out the story about pulsars and how we use them for gravitational waves, uh, that link on your screen at the moment uh, has a couple of stories in there, including what pulsars are and you know what the gravitational wave background is and uh, how we use pulsar timing arrays and also our results from that recent announcement. So if you head over to spaceaustralia.com without the .au on the end, uh, you can see those stories in there and uh, feel free to have a read of them whenever you like. Now, one last very super cool application that we can use pulsars in pulsar timing arrays for is that we can build a galactic scale GPS. So as a few of you might know, here on Earth, we use GPS all the time. So for example, your Google Maps in your phone or on your car, that's using GPS at every second so that it triangulates your position on Earth. And it does that by using multiple different satellites, so three or four of them, to sort of work out where you are based on how long your signal takes to each of these different satellites and bouncing back and forth. Um, effectively, GPS satellites are really accurate clocks that are in orbit around Earth. But say we want to go to the moon or say we want to go to Mars, um, well, there's no GPS system out there, right? So we're going to need a bigger GPS system. But luckily, nature provided one of the most wonderful cosmic clocks, and they're called pulsars, and they're located all across the galaxy. And since they are located across the galaxy, we can actually use them to triangulate a position anywhere in the solar system, um, and thereby we can actually create a, a galactic GPS, a galactic scale GPS system using pulsars, which I think is a really cool uh, application. And I know there's been some work done on this um, with a space station. They've got a telescope on a space station, and it's actually uh, been able to triangulate its position in space to an accuracy of about seven kilometers um, using pulsars. Okay, so to conduct our pulsar science, we employ a technique called pulsar timing. Um, and I'm about to cover some of the basics now. This, this topic is very, very broad. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's very complicated and very broad. Um, and things might get a little bit technical from here. So if you do have questions, please definitely write them down and we can come back and talk about them in the end as well. Um, so a key to a lot of this precision timing experiments in pulsar timing is the ongoing stability of pulsars. And I mentioned earlier on that young pulsars are sort of still sorting themselves out a little bit. They tend to glitch every now and then. So they're not very useful for our pulsar timing, high precision timing experiments. But older pulsars, uh, like millisecond pulses, are very stable. Um, and each pulse from the pulsar itself is unique from the last because there's a variety of reasons. So for example, like, um, you know, there's some small intrinsic changes in the magnetosphere, for example. Uh, you might actually recall a famous album cover from Joy Division actually using that, that, that feature, uh, which is a pulsar signal. But if we look to the right, the animation on the right, once you actually start uh, averaging a few hundred or a few thousand of these pulsar signals together, you start to develop a very, very stable profile. It doesn't vary much over time, um, which is uh, great for millisecond pulsars because they're spinning at 100 times a second, so we can get those profiles uh, nice and neatly as well. Now, millisecond pulsars are extremely stable over the long term. Uh, the clocks that we have here on Earth occasionally do fall out of sync. Even some of the atomic clocks are fall to fall out of sync and introduce errors. But the regular pulses from our millisecond pulsars are stable over the long term. And there, there's been some research into this as well. Um, and that means that we can use them as different as clocks located in different parts of space. And we can really rely on them because of that predictable and that constant re uh, regular ticking as well. Now, I apologize, this, 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 one of, some of these plots, sorry, some of these images are quite complicated. I'm not going to be able to go through the entire process of uh, pulsar timing, but 
you know, I want to highlight key to all of this is that stability of those pulsars uh, of signal arrival times. And because of that stability, it allows us to predict future pulse arrival times as well. And we do that using something called a timing model. And that timing model is basically a mathematical model of everything we know about the pulsars. And we take our observations and we use a very accurate clock at the observatory to measure the signal's pulse arrival time. We treat the data a little bit, so we de-disperse it, we fold it, and then we frame it as a, being at the center of our solar system, at the Barry Center. And then we compare the pulse arrival time to our timing model and our pulse profiles. Um, I'm just skimming over that because it's actually a little bit complicated, but effectively what that does is generate something called timing residuals, which I've plotted here. So timing residuals are the differences between the uh, pulse arrival time and the predicted arrival times. And ideally, good timing residuals will cluster around zero, indicating that there's a close match between the predicted and the observed pulses. And here in this example for pulsar PSRJ 1545 minus uh, 4550, uh, we can see that it's weighted RMS, so its scanner is about 1.15 microseconds, which is pretty great for you know a, cu a couple of years in there. Uh, sorry, what I'm plotting here is the on the x-axis for time and the timing residuals on the y-axis, and the different colors indicate the different frequencies of our uh, of our instrument that we use at Moriang. Okay, so. At this point, I'd like to introduce you to my favorite pulsar, PSR J1713 plus 0747, or J1713, the one that I often call the problem child because, and to be frank, it's a fantastic pulsar, but it loves to keep us on our toes. So this pulsar is actually in a binary system. It features the millisecond pulsar itself um, and a white dwarf companion, and they're both orbiting a common center of mass. And the white dwarf is about the size of Earth, and it's got a mass of about 2.7, sorry, 0.27 to 0.28 solar masses. And the pulsar is about 1.3 to 1.4 solar masses as well. And from our perspective, it's kind of almost edge on. It's like inclined at about 71 degrees from our view. Now, some fun facts about this uh, wonderful system is it's actually the pulsar is spinning on its axis uh, 218 times per second, so roughly about 4% the speed of light. Uh, the distance between the pulsar and the white dwarf is about uh, 20 lunar distances. Um, you know, if a perfect circle is, uh, sorry, if a perfect circle's eccentricity is equal to zero, the eccentricity of this orbit of this system is a near perfect circle. It's at 0 0.0000749. And when we apply a few assumptions, and some, there are some uncertainties involved in this calculation, but when we fly, apply a few assumptions, uh, we think that the actual pulsar's age might be about 8.9 billion years old, but again, uh, those uh, assumptions have, have a high degree of uncertainty on them as well. Um, so it's not just my favourite pulsar. This happens to be a favourite pulsar amongst a lot of the pulsar timing uh, folks around the world uh, because historically it's had a great stable profile. It's bright across a wide band of frequencies. And it has a lack of intrinsic spin noise, which gives us some excellent residuals. So you can see in this plot down the bottom, uh, which the data extends back all the way back to about 2004. So it's a very long time. It's about 19 years of observations. Uh, those timing residuals are still very tightly clustered around zero, uh, which indicates the stability over the long term of this, of, of this particular pulsar. So what makes me interested in this pulsar and what's my research about? Well, in May 2021, radio telescopes around the world started noting that their data showed something weird had happened a month prior in April. Uh, and this, as I said, this pulse was normally stable for a very long time. And what happened was, in, in a nutshell, J1713 threw its toys out of the pram and had a tantrum. Um, and these, uh, in this little graphic here, all these uh, radio telescope uh, icons that you can see on the map are the locations of the telescopes around the world that actually observe this event as well. Now that became the actual motivation for my work and the focus of three big questions that I wanted to answer. And I guess, you know, those questions are, why, why did this pulsar all of a sudden have a massive profile change event? Um, you know, why did it throw a tantrum um, after, you know, you know, us knowing it for so long and, you know, nothing big happening in the past. And so why does this matter to us? Like, why, why is it important? And then can we actually fix it? So that's kind of where the motivation for my research work comes along in. And one thing that we have for our advantage is uh, something that other telescopes around the world don't have. 
And that is that we have the Parkes uh, radio telescope and on the Parkes radio telescope, we have the ultra wide band receiver, uh, which has been installed on the telescope since about 2018, which means that we're the only telescope in the world that observe this profile, this rare profile change event um, across a massive 3.3 gigahertz of bandwidth, which is uh, really lovely to have that sort of data. And so here's what I mean by the pulse of throwing its toys out of the pram. In more scientific terms, J1713's profile underwent a significant uh, change event, and we still don't know why. So remember, millisecond pulsars are meant to be stable rotators. They're not supposed to be doing this kind of things. We're counting on that stability as part of our precision timing experiments to find things like gravitational wave backgrounds. Uh, so when one of them does this, it's quite, it's quite shocking and remarkable. So in this, in this screen, what I'm showing is three different columns, which are three different parts of the band, uh, so sub-bands within our, within our instrument. Uh, in the top row here, we have, this is what the pulsar looks like, uh, the pulsar signal looks like, I should say, uh, in these three different bands. So in the lower band, it's got this lovely feet structure here. In the higher band, you see a bit more detail introduced here, and then you get higher and you start seeing a bit more uh, detail being introduced there. So that top band is what it normally should look like. The red dotted line is the event, which occurs in April 2021. And then May 2021, about two weeks after the event, is our very first observation after the event occurs. And we can see dramatically how that pulsar's profile changed. So it went from looking like this in this band to looking like this. And immediately you can see that the, the top of the profile narrowed while the bottom of the profile extended and grew out a little bit. Uh, in this band, again, we can see that narrowing occurring and then a bit more of a, that broadening. And remarkably, and this is really fascinating to me, this part of the actual pulsar um, its profile, its, uh, its pulse profile, completely narrowed at the top and sort of grew another leg over this part here in this band and completely extended out a bit more as well, including that trailing peak growing as well. So that was May 2021. Uh, in May 2023, which is recently, we also, we've been observing it since then. Um, I've plotted some of their data here. And so between that middle row here, between this row up here and then that bottom row down here, there's about two years of recovery time. And so what my research is looking into is, you know, that change across that period, but also has the actual pulsar fully recovered or, you know, are there any lingering effects? Maybe there's some reconfiguration that happened, which is, again, very, very rare uh, in millisecond pulsars. So looking at it from a different perspective now, we're looking at now the timing residuals, not the profile residuals or the profile changes. Uh, this is what that profile, sorry, this is what the timing of that pulsar looked like over the course of about 2018-2019 onwards. Um, and the different colours again represent different parts of the band. But we can see that it's very tightly clustered around zero around this period. In fact, it's something around, the, the, the scatters around, it's got, a, it's got a good residual value of around uh, 428 uh, nanoseconds, which is pretty incredible. Now watch what happens after the event occurs. Literally throws its toys out of the pram um, this is what things were traveling normal, you know, going all okay. And then all of a sudden the event occurs and the entire band from the very low frequencies to the very high frequencies were thrown out as a result of this profile change event. So that has significant impact on our work when we're looking uh, for things like gravitational wave backgrounds. Um, now, since then, the actual pulsar has, and its, its profile has been recovering, which as a result, the timing residuals have also been recovering. We can see that sort of coming back to its normal area here. But again, my research is looking into if this pulsar has fully recovered or if there's any future, um, sorry, if there's any uh, reconfiguration that has occurred as a result of this profile change event. And you might be thinking, well, why is this important? Well, I guess there's two aspects to this. Uh, the first is, as I just mentioned, uh, millisecond pulsars, uh, profile changes are extremely rare. Um, there's only been one case in the past that, ha that that's happened in, but also, you know, 1713 plays an extremely important role in global pulsar timing array projects. It's probably one of the top three most important pulsars for all pulsar timing teams around the world. And as well as that, it's also used in other si types of science, such as general relativity studies. Now, in 2008 and 2016, a lot of data from other telescopes around the world shows that the pulsar did have these little hiccups, um, and they're quite interesting, but they're not to the magnitude that we've seen with this current change, or sorry, this current profile change event. Um, and it's got me thinking, it's got us thinking actually, it's thinking like, well, what if these changes are occurring in millisecond pulsars, in these stable rotators, but occurring at a level that's much, much smaller than we've been able to, de to detect so far? And so 
understanding of this event will help us understand and sort of look for these types of events in the future, but also if they're occurring at a very, very much smaller scale. Now, along with the actual profile timing and along with the actual uh, 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 timing of the residuals themselves, we're also studying this pulsar in a number of different ways. So we're looking at the intrinsic and external parameters, so such as uh, you know looking at the polarization, which is uh, which is you can see here. The, uh, the near polarization is a red, and the blue polarization is a circular. Um, and so we're looking at changes in polarization, changes in flux density. Uh, changes in the signal to noise pre, during, and post the event. And we're also looking at uh, any effects of uh, the signal propagating or, or as it uh, travels through the interstellar medium between us and the pulsar, and if that introduced any uh, issues as well. Uh, now, what does this all tell us? Well, all this evidence basically says that the pulsar's profile changed across all of our frequencies, the signal arrival times changed across all of our frequencies. The polarizations change across the full band, and there's new features that have appeared in the once very stable profile, which all is pointing towards a very likely outcome that the event that we're seeing is related to the magnetosphere of the pulsar. We don't know exactly what could have caused this, uh, but we, we are looking into the different sort of effects uh, that it's having on the actual profile and on the timing results as well. And also, a good thing. Uh, is that a lot of teams around the world are looking for at this pulsar and, and in particular at this event, and their results are coming to very similar and, and consistent conclusions as we are. So, uh, you know, why, why should we care in summary? What, what's, what's, what's the big deal? Well, profile change events are very rare uh, in, on, on millisecond pulsars in general, uh, but especially rare on uh, you know, very important pulsars like 1713. And we believe this profile change is a result of this magnetospheric event. And it might have actually potentially sustained a long-term change. So if we're able to confirm this, it will only be the second millisecond pulsar to exhibit such behavior that we know about. Now, understanding of this is really crucial, as I just mentioned earlier on. Um, 1713 plays a critical role in pulsar timing campaigns around the world. And if, without characterizing and modeling this change, using its data in the future is going to be fairly challenging. Um, and again, this type of behavior might be occurring on other millisecond pulsars, so we want to know that for sure. Um, we're not really sure if we can fix it at this stage. If there's, there's a couple of different solutions that are being sort of pitched about this, uh, but our first steps are to model it and to change it. And uh, ultimately, we're going to be uh, publishing these results in a paper that we're submitting in later this year. So I think that brings me to the end of my talk. I think I've gone a little bit over time, so I apologize. But uh, Thank you everyone for sticking around to uh, hear about the pulsars and the different kinds of uh, pulsars and also my research. Um, if this sounds like something that you're interested in um, or you want to ask me some questions later on, feel free to sort of reach out to me on socials. I'm on Blue Sky, I'm on uh, Instagram, on uh, LinkedIn and Mastodon and I'm a little bit less on Twitter these days, but I'm, uh, I do have a profile there. My name's Cosmic Barney on that. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this talk and thank you to the ASV for this opportunity as well. So thank you and I'll be happy to take some questions. We have some questions. It's a bit bit tough these days listing your socials, isn't it? Yeah. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube. That's, it just keeps going. All right, so we have a question from uh, Thomas, Thomas P. Crenshaw. Will our sun ever turn into a pulsar? Great question, and no, sorry, can I just check, have you, have you, can you folks see me okay? Yes, yep. Great, great, um, great question, and um, and lucky for us, well, I mean, we won't be here anyway, but it won't, because our sun is uh, too small, it doesn't have enough mass to actually become a pulsar. So if our sun's mass is one, uh, to really to get to a pulsar stage, uh, you need to actually reach to about eight to 25 times the mass of our sun, so that when that core collapse event occurs, you can crush the material down uh, to a point where you actually can make neutrons and the neutron star, but our sun just won't have enough mass to produce that. So our sun will just puff away its outer layers and uh, become a white dwarf eventually. All right, next question. Um, Remus, the AC has an eight and a half meter dish, which it does, and the radio guys are very keen to speak with you and meet with you. Um, what scientific observations akin to your work would you recommend we make with it? And thank you for the talk, Rami. Thank you. Uh, sorry, so the question was, um, what scientific observations can you make with your, uh, the ASB? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'll have to, um, 
I'd, I'd love to speak more about this in detail. I'd be interested to know the type, the type of receiver you folks have. Your I, single I, think, I think it's a hydrogen. I think it's a hydrogen receiver, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, why don't we, um, Mark, if you can connect us to the right people. I mean, we're going yeah. to speak to, and yeah. we'd, love, we'd love the work of amateurs, uh, amateur radio astronomers around and pro-am radio astronomers around the country. We've got a, uh, not sure if you folks know him, a gentleman by the name of Steve Onley, who does some amazing work from his uh, Hawkesbury, uh, just north of Sydney uh, Observatory, where he's got a couple of Yagis, and uh, he's been able to detect Vela, the pulsar, using the Yagis. So um, an eight-metre dish might be quite, Quite cool actually cool that'll be good uh emma wants to know if um if pulsar beams direct uh, beams directly hit earth would it cause effects on humans for example headaches and back pains <laughs> uh not no 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 it won't. um pulses are really very far away and, and the radio beams that we get from them are uh, extremely weak um and we have to sort of uh, amplify the signal quite a bit to actually get up in fact i think i I don't quote me on this, but I've read somewhere um, that all the radio observations in the history of radio ob of astronomy, um, if they were all summed together, the actual um, the force it would apply would be less than a snowflake falling. So it's actually they're very very weak, and there's uh, yeah the signal's very very weak against the background. All right, next question from Shannon. Would I be right in assuming that the first exoplanets that were found around a pulsar were particularly large? No, it's quite the opposite. They were actually tiny. So um, it's interesting because I guess, uh, and, I'm, and, and in a couple of weeks, I'm giving a talk at the uh, Macquarie University uh, Astro Night uh, about this very topic because I find this very fascinating in itself. So when the supernova occurs when the, as part of the pulsar being born, um, any planets that were in the system uh, will either be flung away because of the change of mass, the rapid change of mass of mass distribution in the system, or they might be just blasted away or evaporated as part of the explosion, etc. But sometimes what actually happens is that um, once the pulsars form, a debris field of material is still in orbit around the pulsar at quite a distance from the pulsar. And so over time, that debris field could start coalescing and forming uh, planets, and that, that's called second generation planets. Now, uh, because most of the material has been thrown out from, the, from that system, there's not enough material to form huge planets. They're actually quite small. I think one of the smallest ones we've been able to measure quite precisely, again, because of that uh, uniqueness and precision that we get from uh, pulsar timing experiments is something like, don't quote me, it's like 50% you know, of the mass of the moon or something like, or one that's sort of factor of the mass of the moon. So they're quite small. Tiny, yep. Uh, next question, what have we got, Tim? Uh, what is the source of the intense magnetic field of a pulsar? Is it just combined effect of the magnetic moment of each neutron? Great question. Uh, so there is a, uh, a I guess, a, a number of different approaches to this. Um, I probably will have to get a proper answer for you because I don't remember the top of my head right now. Um, but uh, effectively, the the, the massive, uh, when the progenitor star has a massive sort of magnetic field and spread out across the entire star, when that collapses inward, it prints on, imprints on the actual uh, pulsar itself. Um, and then you're left with this powerful magnetic field. Um, but I will probably get, get a proper answer for you on that because I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, Thomas has got another one for you. Question about timing. Are young pulsars more likely to explode or go nova because of high spin unstable compared to older pulsars? Uh, no, but they, they generally don't um, explode or anything like that. They pretty much remain the way they are. They yeah, they can be in binary systems um, where they accrete material from their from their companions over time, uh, which creates sort of maybe produce, produces hotspots or um, gives them some, some radiative X-ray thermal properties. Um, but they don't know. They don't generally explode. Um, and the older pulsars have already accreted that material um, through that process uh when they're in a binary configuration and they've been spotted for millisecond periods so again they don't explode they just remain and live out their lives for billions and billions of years yep all right we've got a, uh what one two another four questions <laughs> got a few yeah, um, coming. shannon what would the sky look like if you were standing on a pulsar that spins on its axis so fast would it be constant star trails or just plain dizzying 
Very, very good question. And that's, uh, I don't have an exact answer for that right now because I'm about to research that for my talk that's coming up in a few weeks. So my talk in a few weeks is literally going to be, can you imagine living on a pulsar? Like forget all the fact that it'll kill you and it'll vaporize you and it'll crush you from its gravity. If you are able to bypass all of that, can you actually uh, live on a pulsar? And if you could, what would it actually look like? Because some of them are spinning extremely fast at seven, you know, 716 times a second or 200 times a second. Um, some of them not so fast, you know, they spin a bit slower, but I think it'd be quite interesting to, to put yourself on a pulsar and observe the universe around you. Okay, next question from Tim. With the pulsar timing change, can you be sure that it is the pulsar and not a burst of dispersive media passing between the pulsar and Earth that could give the frequency changes that, that recover as the density of the medium reduces with time? I don't know that's if that makes great. sense. No, it does. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah We've got yeah, some yeah. pretty good uh, members within the ASV. So. Yeah, no, but that's, a, that's a very, very cool and very technical question. Um, yes, so we can. Uh, we can we can work out different ways. Of, so we, we, can, we can look at the data in different ways. So effectively, um, let me think about this. There's a couple of ways that the interstellar medium um, can cause uh, the pulsar signal to be uh, dispersed, uh, delayed, or scattered, or broadened as it travels from the pulsar to us. Now, uh, a dispersion measure event usually is uh, has a signature that uh, has the timing residuals scaled uh, with the frequency scale to the power of minus two. And so, uh, when that happens, we actually can can measure that value. And if it's a, a broadening effect, it actually uh, sorry, a scattering effect. The frequency then scales to the power of uh, frequency to the power of minus four. And again. Uh, when we checked our data for this case, none of those things were uh, were showing. Um, there's also something called plasma lensing, in which that uh, you know the pulsar, the, the interstellar medium causes uh, multiple images of the pulsar to be presented at, at slight delays. Um, but we don't think that's happening without, in this case, because effectively uh, there's complex morphologies that we're seeing across different parts of the band that aren't reflected in the profile. It's not the same profile that's sort of being replicated at different times. It's there's unique sort of features in the profile there. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. We we don't I should have saying we don't think we we don't think it's actually the interstellar medium. We're not ruling it out either, but we're we're pretty certain this is magnetospheric in origin. Uh, we're like you know I'm not going to put a number on it, but we're very very certain it's magnetospheric in origin. But there's always uh, I don't like to. I like to actually add a bit of uncertainty into my answers because you know, that's what science is. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, Rebecca has a question: What kind of lifetime do pulsars have? Does it differ from usual neutron stars? Yeah, it's a great question again. So uh, pulsars, the classical pulsar, the young pulsars, and when I call them pulsars, it's because they're beaming pulse beams in our direction. They probably differ about ten to about a hundred million years, um, but, but then. Uh, as if you remember that diagram, the PP dot diagram, they, some of them get spun back up, and that process takes billions of years. But once they're spun back up, they can actually last for a very, very long time. So, um, you know, another couple of billion years. We don't really know the accurate answer to that because we've never been around for billions of years to measure the start and end time. But we, the, the process of forming a, a, a millisecond pulsar requires the companion star to undergo its. Uh, it's nuclear timeframes, which means that, that that process takes billions of years and therefore the millisecond pulsar has been around during that process to be spun up. It hasn't been destroyed or, or wandered away. So uh, they last for a very long time. They firmly cool over time um, if they're just, you know, right, cooling neutron stars. So uh, we don't really know the exact number, though. All right. And last one. Um are the neutrons in the neutron star created by a reverse beta minus decay? If so, would it still occur in the absence of anti-neutrinos? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that question? So it's uh, the reverse neutron. Sorry, I didn't catch up. Are the neutrons in the neutron star created via reverse beta minus decay? If yeah, so, so, would it still occur in the absence of anti-neutrinos? Uh, I think that question is a bit confusing for me, but effectively, the neutrons are created during the core collapse event when the uh, when the when the star is collapsing, that core is collapsing. The the uh, protons and the electrons are squeezed together to form neutrons, and they emit a neutrino as part of that process. And so um, that's how the neutrons get their 
uh, during that core collapse event. That's why there's so much amount of squeeze into the actual neutron star because you're literally forcing the protons and neutrons, sorry, protons and electrons into each other and actually creating neutrons and then releasing the actual uh, the, the residual from that, which is the neutrino. Yep. All right. Last one is from Barry. Um, Barry's our former librarian who I don't think he quite understands how the internet works. Barry, you're not meant to ring me midstream to get me to ask a question. You're meant to pop it in the chat, which he finally did. Ask, is the density of pulsars the same as neutron stars, 1 billion tonnes per cubic centimetre? Yeah, so ne neutron stars are, and pulsars are the same thing. There's just one of them actually emitting radio waves that we detect. So uh, the densities are based on their, uh, their radius and their volume and the amount of mass they have inside that radius and volume. So some neutron stars are two times the solar mass. Sometimes uh, they're uh, uh, 1.4 times the solar mass. So if you use those numbers to work out the uh, with, with the radius of that star, you can work out its density as well. So that will uh, depend on how much mass is squeezed into that area. Wonderful. I think that that, that rounds out our questions. Um, Rami, thank you very much for presenting for us tonight. It's It's been a wonderful talk. Um, you've thank got you a, lot of, a lot of, a lot of interested question, interesting questions. Um, everyone loved it, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, as Clint says, lovely talk, Rami. Pulsars are a fascinating phenomenon. Our radio astronomy section would love to talk to you for sure. Clint was the yes. former section. He's the former section director of our radio astronomy section. So Fantastic. we've had most of our radio guys tuned in tonight listening to you. Great. So, Mark, if you, if you could put me in touch via email or something, that'd be great because, um, yeah, we'd definitely have to talk to you folks. I will uh, put you in touch mm -hmm. with Phil um, Phil Costigan, who is our current section director and I'll give you his email address and I'll give him your email address and we can get you guys lined up. I think uh, the radio guys are also going to be at uh, Sea Lake as well, which will be very cool. Oh, I know our space exploration section would love to have you um, give a talk to, to the members as well um, at some stage. So, yeah, a lot of inquiry about you, that's for sure. Everyone's been very excited to have you come along. Awesome. It's great to hear. Thank you for having me again. It's been a, it's been Not a problem. Uh, and for everyone else, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's uh, been uh, one of the more interesting streams that we've we've had for a while, which is great. Um, and the ASV would love to thank everyone for joining us for this evening's stream. And we want to thank Rami for his wonderful presentations on pulsars. Dad joke coming in. It was a pulsating talk. Um, sorry, I can't resist. <laughs> no comment. I'm sure you've heard that one before. Yes. Um, we hope everyone enjoyed tonight's stream and we look forward to our talk in a few weeks with Elisa Harvey-Smith uh, on the, or on, I think it's uh, two Wednesdays from now it is. I'm not sure off the top of my head what date that is. Uh, and don't forget all of those wonderful ASV events and member event, uh, public events and member events we've got coming up. Check the website out for that. Uh, once again, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like button. I think it's subscribe button. That's what I'm thinking for. And Facebook is the like button. Uh, and we will see you in a few weeks. We'll see you later. See you, guys.